This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, it's Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And once again, that, that song is one of my old favorites. It's by Simon and Garfunkel. And it's about darkness. It's about stillness. It's about how you find peace within yourself, even though it's dark. And it's a very important show today because we're going to be talking about how the ancient wisdom of the ancient wise men and how technology is keeping our brain completely overactivated, overstimulated. And if we're overstimulated, then we have no peace, no happiness, and we're constantly going for it, you know, success addicted. Any comments, Kim? Well, we've got a very, very special guest today. He's been on our show several times. And, um, you know, we've, we've actually studied as a group two of his books. This might be the third one. Um, he wrote Ego is the Enemy and The Obstacle is the Way. Our whole company studied The Obstacle is the Way. Some of, um, some of our guys in our company say it's the best book they've ever read. Our guest is Ryan Holiday. He's a best-selling author, media and marketing strategist, and the founder of Brass Check a strategic marketing and advisory firm. And his newest book, which is just released, is called Stillness is the Key. So welcome to the show, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me. And that was a very, very kind introduction. I, I'm, I'm very grateful. Well, it's it's the truth. And uh, we do love to study great books. And uh, both Ego is the Enemy, Obstacle is the Way are two of our favorites. You also wrote uh, Perennial Seller, The Art of Making and Marketing Works That Lasts, and Conspiracy, which was a totally different type of book about um, Peter Thiel, Hulk Hogan, and Gawker. That was a whole different subject. So, um, yeah. yeah, we're anxious to talk to you about stillness. What, uh, why, why did you write this? Why now? Why, how is it different from, you know, things sure. like Power of Now, all of that? Yeah, stillness is this thing where when I say that word, I think everyone knows what I'm talking about, even if they would struggle to define it, even if I would struggle to define it. We know what it feels like when sort of everything slows down, when, when, when we've eliminated distractions, when it doesn't matter what's going on in the outside world, we're able to focus on what's ever in front of us, we can make good decisions, we can be happy, we can, we can know what's important, we can enjoy, you know, the moment. And so as important as we know that that is, and as natural as stillness is, I think what's remarkable about it is how rare it is. Like the, the, the moments of stillness that I can recall in my own life um, are some of my favorite moments. And then I go, well, how often does that happen? And the answer is, you know, not nearly often enough. And so I wanted to write a book about this idea because why is this important thing so rare? And if so much good stuff comes from it, why can't we have more of it? And as, as I studied and I looked at the, the literature and the science and the history of of, of this idea, what was so remarkable to me, and why I felt like I had to write the book, was basically every wise school and philosophy and religion of history has all held up stillness as being the highest good, from the Christians to the Confucians to the Buddhists to the Stoics. You know, the, the idea that if, if all of the wise people of history agreed that this thing was really important, it probably is really important, and it, it probably says something about where we are today that we've, that we've still lost our hold on it. So the big, the big point here, you know, we, we all know we're kind of overstimulated with so much information pouring at us every day. Like, I've, sure. I, I'm getting addicted to YouTube and all this other stuff. And the hardest part for me, you know, the key, for me the key to success is can I stop and stop thinking? You know, can yeah. I just shut my mind off? and sit still for even if it's two minutes to half an hour, it's the greatest luxury I can give myself. And yet it's, it's really, really tough. You know, I mean, when I was a kid, all we had was a radio, then we had TV, and now we have 25 million channels, billion channels coming over our, our cell phones. So what, what would you say are the benefits? I must say it another way. When somebody <laughs> asks me, what's the key to success? I says, do nothing. You know, yeah, sure. You know, if you can, if you can just sit there and be quiet, just be with nature, you know, and shut your mind off, you have a better chance of success in, you know, in life. 
Is that what and you're not, saying? Not only is, is, are those moments sort of special and enjoyable, but, but I would argue from a business perspective, that's where all my best ideas have come right. from. That's, that's, that's where, you know, uh, an idea crept into my head that made me a lot of money, or that's where my next book comes from, or that's where the solution to that problem that I've just been struggling with that I couldn't figure a way out of suddenly sort of appears. So it's, it's, it's about carving out the space and the time for you to do the really important thing, uh, which, which, as you're saying, is in a way it's, it's kind of nothing. And, and, you know, what's so interesting is, yes, like we certainly have more technology than ever, and it makes stillness harder. But I, I open the book with a, a, a quote from Blaise Pascal in the 1500s. He's saying, uh, all of man's problems stem from his inability to sit in a room quietly alone. So we've struggled with this forever, and technology has made it worse. But, I mean, the, the interesting thing is sometimes you do have time to sit there by yourself, and the noise you find is not coming from the outside. It's that running loop in your own brain of anxiety or envy or, you know, your own childhood issues, and that's what's preventing the stillness. So um, it's not just a technological problem, but I think it's a it's – a, cultural problem and, a, and an individual problem as well. Well, it's, it's, it's difficult to quiet that mind because we're racing with a million things we've got to do. But also, you know what I find, Ryan, is that people don't like sitting quietly or being alone. It's very uncomfortable. They're used to all this stimulation. And so to sit quietly is really uncomfortable for a lot of people or just to be alone is uncomfortable. Yeah, there, there's a study I talk about in the book. They, they, would, they ask these participants that sit here and say, okay, if you can sit here quietly by yourself, you can't do anything for the next 15 minutes, or you can press this button, which will give you an electrical shock, and then you can get up and leave right now. And uh, the vast majority of people chose to actually hurt themselves <laughs> oh and goodness. get an electrical shock <laughs> than to sit quietly with their own thoughts. And then, and then these are probably the same people who are wondering why, you know, they're not progressing in their field, why they're not having... why. Well, you know, where they, they don't understand where great art or insights come from. And it's like, yeah, because you're depriving yourself of the stillness and the quiet and the nothingness from which so, so much creativity and, and success comes from. And that's why I, when, I look, when I look back at education, they're trying to educate your mind. And, you know, I, I, I'm not Buddhist or Christian or anything like that, but in the, my sister's one of the few women ordained by the Dalai Lama, and she says, the key, the key to nirvana, wherever they go, is to shut your mind up. Yeah. And that is probably one of the hardest things for the Western mind to do, especially when all this pressure is, you gotta go to the right school, get the right grades, you gotta study these courses and all that. And it keeps our minds just completely, what I call, interpolated, you know, this good anxiety, the you know fear, pressure you know I'm going God, so that's why you know one of the things that you know my uh, cardiologist Dr. Kopalin said to me he says, you better start meditating because the only thing that's killing you is your mind, and so many people put so much emphasis on their brain how smart they are what you know, creative ideas and all that, and I find the hardest thing to do is just sit quietly and have no thoughts no thing in my mind. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so that, I mean, that's kind of, that's the big step. So you've got the technology and, and people are addicted to their cell phones. Step number one, you got to, you got to turn off that cell phone occasionally. But then sure. how, then how do you, how do you quiet the mind? Because the mind to me is louder. My thoughts running through my head are louder than all the no outside noises. Yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, I, 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 I think there's a couple of things here. So one, um, we want to narrow what we're thinking about. So one of, the, one of the, I think, the most important ways to get to what we're talking about is just this idea of being present, of going, the things that have already happened in the past, no amount of thinking is going to change. And the things that are off in the future are largely outside of our control. So instead, I'm going to focus exclusively on this thing that's in front of me. What I'm not going to do is is is, is allow my mind to drift. So I'm going to keep coming back to the thing that's in 
in front of me. And I think that's where a lot of people struggle. They, they, and in a way, this is kind of a, uh, an egotistical thing to do, right? The idea that, like, uh, you can write this book or you can negotiate this deal or you can perform, you know, in front of this audience that you're about to do as you're also thinking about ten other things at the same time, right? I think what, what I try to tell myself is, no, this thing that's in front of me, even if it's not important, is actually the most important thing in the world. And I'm going to give everything that I have to that. And uh, in so doing, I'm, I'm naturally just sort of eliminating a bunch of other things that my mind, you know, might, might, uh, might drift towards. And, 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 go ahead. and that's something that you have to constantly remind yourself of. You've got to be really aware to even notice that your thoughts are drifting. Yeah, yeah, of course. The mind is, is naturally sort of drifting away from being present, and you have to kind of be bringing it back constantly. And, and, and that idea of sort of emptying the mind is really important. I, I'm, a, I'm a big baseball fan, and, and, and I think the best example of this is, is like what a batter is thinking about at the plate. You know, it's basically physically impossible to hit a baseball. A baseball leaves the pitcher's hand, and it arrives in the strike zone in roughly 400 milliseconds. Right, so if your mind is, if you're thinking about your batting average, if you're thinking about what a newspaper reporter said about you, if you're thinking about, you know, where you parked your car, if you're thinking about the argument that you had with your spouse the night before, all of that is going to eat up uh, uh, precious time in a thing where you have almost no margin for error. So what you have to be doing is just thinking about what's in front of you. You have to be fully present. You have to be fully attentive. And, and you have to push everything else out of your mind or, or this hard thing is going to be impossible. And, and Yogi Berra said it best. He said it's impossible to hit and think at the same time. And I think it's impossible to write and think at the same time, to, 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 be, you know, to perform and, and, and think at the same time to do anything at this and think at the same time. It's, we just can't do it. I wish we could, but we can't. So one of the, the hardest things, I don't know if you're saying the same thing, but for me, the hardest thing to do is shut my mind off. Yeah, of course. And, and, and I think we see this uh, pretty clearly, like when we're trying to go to sleep at night. If we, <laughs> if we haven't sort of wound ourselves down, if, we, if we're living a chaotic life, if we're not orderly and disciplined, you know, you lay down, and sure, it's quiet and dark, but there's a rock concert going on in your head, basically, and then that's why you can't fall asleep. And, and again, so many people, instead of saying, well, I'm going to figure this out, I'm going to develop a, a sort of a nighttime ritual, I'm going to do some journaling, I'm going to eliminate a lot of these things that are upsetting me from my life, they go, oh, I'll just take a pill. And then they, they do go to sleep, but the, they're just deferring the problem. And, and, and I think... You know, a lot of people just haven't sat with either the feelings that are upsetting them or the worries that are upsetting them, or, or they don't want to look at, you know, what that voice in their head is trying to tell them. Maybe it's that you hate your job and you should quit and do something else, or, you know, maybe it's that this relationship is not the right one for you. But instead of facing that, we stuff it down or we pretend it's not there, and then eventually it explodes all over us, I think. So when we come back, I want to ask you some of the solutions. Because <coughs> I think you're talking about the problem and not the solution here. So yeah. I want to find out, because look, I'm, I'm just trying to say something, you know. The moment I'm thinking or talking, I'm not in stillness. I'm in my mind. And, you know, being raised in my mother's side was Buddhist. And their whole thing was that could you get to that point where there was nothing. And that, and so thinking is actually the enemy to me. And if I'm thinking, then it's not me. Or as a lot of times in Dr. Gopalan, my, my cardiologist was saying, can you observe the thinker? You know, and then can you observe the observer observing the thinker? In mm -hmm. other words, can you go into, into another dimension of beingness? And I think that's the hardest part for most people to get at. And most, and so the moment you're thinking and giving advice, you're not present anymore. You're you're not still. You're thinking about advice. So the hardest thing for me is to stop thinking, which is one of the reasons I find so many kids in school all stressed out, because I've looked at some of the textbook these kids are going through. It's horrible. It's painful stuff. Just painful stuff. 
because their minds get all interpolated. Then they come and they get they get social media and they, they get their emotions all in thrall in worked up and. So it's very important what you're writing about here is this thing called stillness, but the moment we think about stillness, we're not thinking, and we're not still. That's the trap. We come back, we're going more into the be- the art and benefits of stillness, a very important subject. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news and about money. Again, once again, that's this oldie but goodie from Simon and Garfunkel, The Sounds of Silence, which is kind of an oxymoron. It's how can you have a sound of silence? So you can listen to this program anytime, anywhere on richdadradio.com. We archive our programs because repetition is one of the ways we learn. And uh, just go to richdadradio.com, listen to this. You can you can listen to it again. You'll learn even more. And you can talk to your friends, family, especially business associates about this subject. That's why the, all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. Our program today is a very important program. It's, it's called... It's by um, Ryan Holiday, and we have studied his other books, and they've been transformational. You know, it's just fantastic. He's, a, he's such a fantastic writer. The trouble is he's writing on this book about a very elusive subject called stillness. Stillness is the key. It comes out in October 2019. And let me tell you, sports fans, if you can find stillness, you got the, you got the magic to life because our whole society thinks too much. You know, I meet so many people that got their good ideas. When you're thinking, you operate in this world called right and wrong. And if you're in stillness, there is no right or wrong. It does not exist. And oftentimes I meet so-called smart or educated people. They're always in this world of right and wrong. Like I was talking to my friend about, you know, I go to this natural path to treat me. And he says, well, that's wrong. And I said, why would you say that? It's just wrong. And this is the point, you know, the thing that I've, all the years I've been, I've been studying this since 1973. And the moment you live in the duality of right and wrong, you're in your mind. And stillness does not live in duality of up and down, right or wrong, good and bad. Stillness is just zero. And some of the hardest things I have to do, especially today in our over-communicated to world, is how do I achieve stillness? So almost, I, th- I would say, five out of seven mornings a week, I get up, I follow this book called Miracle Morning, and my whole objective is to achieve maybe 30 seconds of stillness, where it's absolutely still. If you can achieve that, you don't live in this world of right and wrong, good and bad, success and failure. And that's the key to, in my opinion, key to success. Success, because when you're, when you're completely still, God can talk to you. But if you're completely chattering away, God can't talk to you. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's beautiful. I mean, in, in my own morning routine, it's, it's about the same thing. I, <clears throat> I, I usually go for a long walk with my son. I want to be outside. I don't want to have my phone with me. Actually, the, the new thing I've started doing is I don't touch my phone for the first one hour that I'm awake. I don't sleep with the phone in my room. So that actually means, you know, from whatever I touch the, my, my phone last in the evening until I touch it for the first time in the, in, in the morning could be, you know, uh, between as many as, as eight and, and ten hours. And, and what I'm trying to do is carve out space for myself, carve out time to be uh, – uh, in the moment, and I, I want to do as sort of many natural, slow, and still things as possible. So that's going for a walk, that's spending time with my, with my family, that's uh, sitting down with a journal, writing things down. And, and I think these are all ways to, to keep the distractions of the world away and also to keep you from getting too lost in your own thoughts. I mean, to me, one of the reasons that journaling is such a valuable practice is that you're taking those thoughts that are bouncing around in your head and you're putting them down on paper and getting rid of them. So in my journal, it's, it's the things that I'm anxious about, the things that I'm worried about, the things that I want to be working on, and I'm, I'm taking them out of my head where I don't control them and putting them down on a piece of paper where I can get a little relief from that. So, so I think 
this idea of having a ritual and a routine is a great way to, to build stillness into and, your life. So you're, and, <clears throat> excuse me. So you're talking about rituals. Robert's talking about a ritual. Um, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I also, I also do journaling almost every morning. And what I find when I journal is it does quiet my mind. I get the thoughts out, but also there's usually a question that I'm asking as I'm journaling. And as I keep writing, my mind kind of quiets. And usually by the end, I keep writing until there, an answer comes. And the answer comes because my mind is more quiet. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and isn't it remarkable that the answer... I mean, obviously, the answer was already in your mind because that's where it came from, and yet you didn't know it. And so we can have these really difficult, vexing questions. You know, should I should I quit my job? Should I uh, agree to 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 you know to this offer or that offer? You know, should I let this go? Should I forgive this person? And and when we sit down and and write and we're present in that way, and the the, the sort of thought the thoughts are just flowing out of our mind, down through our arm, and onto the paper, that, that the answer just appears to us. And, and I don't know where that comes from, but I find it to be very powerful, and that's why you want to have that stillness. I, I do know that where the answer doesn't come from, where the, you don't get the answer, you know, at 3 p.m. in the middle of a busy day, you know, surrounded by other people um, in a coffee shop. That's not where that happens. So there's something about you know, getting up early, doing this at the beginning of the day, having the ritual and routine, and then, yeah, carving out the space to go, like, I need to, to solve this problem, or I need to think about this question, and I'm not going to leave here in, until I come up with an answer. And if you look at a lot of the successful business people, if you read their biographies and there's a tough decision to make, they often find that quiet time. And you use a good example with Kennedy and the um, Cuban Missile Crisis. And he kept seeking those quiet moments to figure out what needs what needed to be done. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, one of the most interesting things I found as I was studying the Cuban Missile Crisis is this letter that Kennedy writes to the gardener for the White House for her important contributions to saving humanity during the Cuban Missile Crisis because he'd spent so much time in the White House Rose Garden as he's wrestling with this enormous decision. And, and the idea of just going out there where there's some quiet, where there's some beauty, um, where there's order, uh, it was just, you know, very important as he wrestled with, with how, to, how, to, how to look at this thing. And, and so, yeah, if our, if our house is a mess, if our life is a mess, if our routine is a mess, we're not going to have stillness. And, in fact, we have the opposite of stillness, and good decisions don't come when we are frenzied or busy or overwhelmed. Correct. So anyway, um, you have you have three parts: body, mind, and spirit. Where do emotions fit in? So I put that in the spirit. I, you know, so much we were sort of talking about clearing the mind, and we're also talking about things like going you for a walk. Put spirit and emotion together. Yeah, I, I think I think it's wow. the, the the emotions are there in the soul, and so if you're the kind of person who, um, you know, is is driven by you know, these urges inside, you have no control over your desire or your lust or your ambition, or if you're the kind of person who is, who is ripped apart by jealousy, or if you're a person who, who, um, who never has enough, right? There's nothing that, that you could, will ever satisfy you. It doesn't matter how, what kind of routine you have. It doesn't matter how often you clear your mind. You're never going to have any stillness because you know, you've got that kind of hungry heart that, that, that is just uh, causing you misery and despair. It's funny. You put spirit and emotion together, and I put emotion in a category by itself. Interesting. Yeah, because there, there was a book called EQ, you know, um, mm-hmm. and, you know, to me, emotion gets in the way of my spirit. So anyway, that's, that's it's your, your, your book. No, but no, I, I, I agree I'm, with I'm that. Doing I mean, my to best me, this to... is about sort of calming those emotions so you can have a spirit that's at peace. If you're, if you're someone who has no control over your temper, not only are you not going to have stillness because you're going to be fighting with people all the time, but even when you're quiet and alone sitting in your own house, you're just going to be stewing on the things that have upset you and the grudges that you nurse. I, I tell the story of Michael Jordan. You know, Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player of all time, and when he accepts his induction into the Basketball Hall of Fame, 
he gets up and gives this speech where you basically realize that it has not been fun to be Michael Jordan because here he is holding on to the fact that he got cut from his high school basketball team and he's still mad at a coach who didn't give him a varsity spot, you know, 25 years ago. You're just like, wow, that, is, that might be what it, that might have helped you win, but it also prevented you from enjoying the, the success that you had. So you you have in part three of the body again. I I don't yeah. hold I don't hold spirit and emotion. It's the same thing. I mean, my emotions are very very different characters, and that's where a lot of my different characters show up, right, Kim? <laughs> yeah, you got a few characters, <clears throat> a few characters. Anyway, so but we do but we do recognize that emotions are like one of the key drivers of all of this. Well, um, I, I, I you know I deal with people, and you know in the so called domain called financial success and the main reason mm-hmm. pe- most people are not successful financial is because they're fear of failing sure that's not spiritual you know that's that's sure terror and why what what will people think of me what will people say if i feel you know they can't even control their so the emotions jack up their brain another sure. another thing i i was my i have i have a very good friend john and jw we, we all played rugby together in hawaii and they turned into this world of um body, mind, and spirit, and emotions. But um, he says depression occurs when you're stuck in the past. And anxiety is fear of the future. I think that's right. And the, per- the personal reason, when, you know, that's been really good for me, because when I'm either depressed or I'm in anxiety, I, I use my mind then to put it in categories. Is it the past or is it the future? And then with that, I categorized down to absolute doing my best to be still. And as I said, in a half an hour, if I can get 30 seconds of stillness in, which is rare, it's yeah. doing, I'm doing very, very good for the day because I let go of the past and the future. And that, that's kind of my process, which I do in the mornings. So it probably doesn't work for most people, but that's what I do. Because if I don't get into stillness, I don't have any new thoughts come in because my thoughts are basically 90% recycle thoughts about the past and the future. And I, sure. and I think if somebody could just be quiet, like turn off their cell phone for a half an hour or what, just, what, what? just be quiet for like 10 minutes and have no distractions, I mean, that would be huge. But I gotta watch the stock market. I mean, I I mean they this. now say the average, I think the average attention span of an adult right now is eight seconds. That's it, eight seconds, wow. that's it. So and, can you and, imagine being quiet for like 10 minutes? That's and, and that doesn't seem like a lot, but you have to so realize much. how little most people have. And so I want people to realize um, this isn't just like some sort of woo-woo Eastern stuff that will, will only affect your personal happiness. It's, this can help you in your job. It can help you in your personal life. If, if 10 minutes of stillness might be all you need, to have a massive life-changing breakthrough. You, only, you might only need one breakthrough in your whole life, and that might come from 10 minutes on a Tuesday morning uh, when you got up before everyone else and, and you sat there and you put in the work. And, yep. and so I think that's really important. I agree, and, and I Rob, agree, because a lot of times, you know, like I meditate, then I go take a shower, and all of a sudden new thoughts start popping up. But it, not, new thoughts don't pop up if I walk into the shower angry or depressed or fearful. And then, no, you know, that's totally right. And especially with when it comes to the subject of money, I mean, most people can't even think because they're either so angry, fearful, or whatever's going on with them. So, or they. No, that's right. And look, the, another place that I find a lot of stillness, and and, and you mentioned uh, this with with rugby. For me, it's having a hobby or an activity that I do that's very different than what I do professionally that allows me or forces me to be present. And then thoughts jump into my mind. So, you know, I, I try to swim or run every single day, and it's, it's usually 20 or 30 minutes into that exercise um, that, that I find, oh, wait, I haven't thought about anything for the last 20 minutes. And, and then, you know, a, a chapter title pops into my head or a story pops into my head or, a, or something that uh, I want someone on my team to go do. And so... I tend to have these breakthroughs when I'm pursuing my hobbies or activities that are keeping me very much in the moment. So I don't want people to think that stillness is the absence of activity. 
it might be actually you need to play more rugby every week or you need to you need to work less and have more time doing these activities or hobbies that you like because it's ultimately going to make you better at what you do. And I think most people have something like that. I mean, they have something that where they feel peaceful, where they feel joyful, where they feel something outside of probably their work, most likely. Yeah. For, for the lucky ones, it is their work. Um, but I think everybody has that. It's just a matter of, of realizing that, being aware of it, and spending more time there. For me, it's and, nature. And I, feel- I, I dwell in nature. I do great in nature. And not feeling guilty, like, right. oh, I should be at work, but here I am taking this walk through the woods. It's like, actually, this walk through the woods is the most important thing that I'm going to do today. And, and I'm not, I don't need to explain myself to anyone. I don't, need to, I don't need to make up for this later. You know, for me, when I go swimming, like, that is, I, I earmark that in my schedule, knowing, like, I'm probably going to have a, some sort of creative breakthrough from this experience. So... I don't, if somebody wants to get on the phone from two to three and I was planning on going swimming, like swimming takes the priority because it's going to have the greater ROI for me. All right, good. Hey, Ryan, again, your book, is Stillness is a Key. Thank you for writing it. Uh, all of your, the thing I'm jealous about, you're such a great, clear writer. I mean, you're a very excellent communicator. So I recommend everybody get his book, Stillness is the Key. Again, it comes out in October 2019. Because in my personal experience, the, one of the highest objectives every day of my life is to achieve some degree of stillness. That means get my mind and my thoughts and my emotions and my body out of the way. That is the most powerful thing a person can do. Because then it allows other those thoughts to Correct. come in that are going to really, really take you to the next level. Correct. And most people are wired. T- yeah, t- <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> So again, thank you very much, Ryan. Thank the you, book Ryan. Is still so is just a key. Just released. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Talk soon. Okay. Thank thanks. Bye bye. And we come back. We're going to the most popular part of our program, which is Ask Robert. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Once again, I want to thank Ryan Holiday and the introduction to his new book, Stillness is the Key. We've studied two of his books: Obstacle is the Way and Ego is the Enemy. He is an incredible writer. I mean, he has a way of getting through your own defenses. And he, he really is a, I wish I could write as well as he did. So his book, Stillness is a Key, is very important because as we're talking about it, we're in an over-communicated to a world. We're stressed out and, you know, things are coming at us faster and faster and faster. So if you can find some stillness in your life, I think it'll make life a lot better. So you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android, and all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. Any comments, Kim? Yeah, you know, stillness, um, we call it awareness. We call it being present. Um, it's not a new subject by any means. It goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. So the problem is at the moment you label it, you're in your mind. That's not stillness. Yeah, That's it? the trap. The trap is you got to get out of your mind. Yeah, as soon as you say, I'm present, then you're not present you're not anymore. Present. You I'm labeled. still, you're not still anymore. And the reason we have murders and all this stuff is the moment you label somebody as good or bad, you're at war. Or you say this person's a Jew and this person's an Irishman. You've labeled them. And that's and the problem with our minds. When you label, you stop learning. You've yeah. already put them in a box. They already said this is who that person is or this is what this is, and you stop learning. So the real challenge is, especially if you hate the SOB, can you get the stillness and find love for them, mm-hmm. be one with them? That is the hardest thing to do. And I think one of the problems with this society especially, versus I come from an Asian society, the Asians have always just worship meditation and silence. But in when I went to a Christian thing, it was you had to memorize stuff and listen to the stories and do all that stuff. You're back in your mind. So the reason I think stillness is the key for many people who read it is can you get to stillness? It's the hardest thing there is. And, and as I was saying that, you know, there's, there's so many different books out there, but what I like about Ryan is he, goes, he, he takes it from a historical point of view as well and gives a lot of examples that kind of give you a different perspective on stillness. So um, it's, it's a great read, and I recommend it. Stillness is the key. If I could talk about my book, it's called Fake I write about in fake some of the most the high the times I've been most alive is when I'm on the verge of death. And that's why I'm not so afraid of death. 
because I've been there so many times in Vietnam. But I was writing about it in, at nights before a mission. I would sit on the bow of the aircraft carrier knowing that tomorrow at four o'clock in the morning might be my last day. And when you're kind of facing the last day of your life, you kind of get, things are not that important anymore. And I, I could find stillness. So I'd sit on the bow of the aircraft carrier and I could hear the waves going, I could feel the carrier going up and down. Then I'd go in at five o'clock for, for breakfast and we'd brief at 5.30. And we'd strap into our aircraft and fly, fly to meet death. It is peaceful. It's not fearful. It is peaceful. And then I write about it in fake because that one day my engine quit at about 1,500 feet and then I went exterior. I left my body. And that's what I was talking about. Can you observe the observer? And most people can't shut their mind up because they can't observe their mind. So what the Buddhists talk about is can you step back and observe your mind thinking? And then the next question is can you observe the observer observing the thinker? That's when you get to the really higher levels of spirituality. So I kind of disagree with, with Ryan saying that emotions are part of it. That day when my engine quit and I, I was looking at death, and it was right imminent in front of me. If I screw it up, we were dead at 1,500 feet. So I went out of my body. I could see myself flying the aircraft. Then I could see the person watching me fly the aircraft. And I was getting, in my experience, exterior, close to God. And I knew at that moment I had a choice. I could live or die. It's a, it's a stillness. So I write about it in fake. And some people, when so when I am troubled, I'm doing my best to get as still as possible to observe me being upset, me being sad, me being lonely. Can I observe me? And then I've, 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 I've got out of the situation. So again, I disagree with the thing about your spirit is emotional. <laughs> no, it's just spirit, it's calm, quiet. I've looked at death so many times, I'm not afraid of dying. I mean, I don't want to die, but you can't fear, because when I got close to death, I got more alive. It's a paradox. So that's, that's why I trust you'll read Stillness is the Key, because like I said, Ryan is a great writer. Once again, you can submit your questions to ask Robert at richdadradio.com. So Melissa, what's the first question? Our question today comes from Brianna in Cedar Falls, Iowa. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. She says, Robert and Kim, my husband and I are two years into owning our own business. We have negotiated a lot of the issues well together. However, I'm seeing that there are now things coming up that we aren't in sync on. My question is, how do the two of you manage your businesses and lives so well together? Well, I think that's one of the biggest fallacies that people have is that they think life should be perfect. And that's not what life is about. If you have a mind, a body, emotions, and a spirit, it's up and down. And you know, Kim and I had a friend who always said that she and her husband had a, a perfect marriage, they never argued. The moment I heard that, I went, you're BSing me. I mean, so there is this part of the ego, especially that wants to pretend they have the perfect life, we're successful and all that. I was watching this very successful investor on television, he was saying the same thing. He says, my wife and I have never argued, she's the perfect wife, been married, for, we have the perfect daughters, our daughters are wonderful, we give to charity and all this stuff. And I'm going, that's not my experience of life. Do, do, do you know what I mean? But I think there's part of the psychosis or the ego that thinks you're supposed to be perfect. And that's not real life. The moment you have a body, a mind, and emotions, and this, and you're in business, it's a rocky road. So the only way I handle it for Kim and I is that when we're upset, it's an opportunity to get clear on something. What most people do is when they get upset, they run from the upset rather than go through the upset. So I kind of welcome the upset because it's a chance for me to get clearer about me. Any comments on that, Kim? Well, 
if you're going to go into business, you're going to face problems every single day. Jesus, H. Christ. Every single day. And and somebody <laughs> once said, you know, if the two of you are business partners and you agree on everything, then one of you is not necessary. <laughs> because if you agree on everything, you're, as partners, you're supposed to, you know, give and take and, and be soundboards and have different points of view and look at things differently. So um, the fact that you have some issues, um, you're going to have issues with You're business alive. all along. I, I don't, I don't, you know, that's part of the, that's part of the game. If you want to have a comfortable life, do not go into business, especially with your husband or wife. <laughs> and, the, and the thing is, is to look at the upset or the anger or the emotion as an opportunity to grow. Just like, you know, whether there's big problems in a business, I just look at them, okay, I'm going to learn a lot from this because it's something I didn't know. Well, and, it go, and it goes back to stillness book. Yeah. Is if if there's an upset, we ha- you have to be aware first of all that I'm upset, and then have the awareness to go. Well, let's see what's behind the upset, and yeah, that's Kim, what we do. And Kim and I have had many, many quite massive financial problems, and the only way I can get through it is just take a deep breath, get still, and say, okay, when I get through, or we get through this, we'll be smarter and richer. Whereas most people pretend they don't have problems. And I think that's the problem with a psychotic, screwed-up society. And it goes from goes to our schools where if you make a mistake, it means you're stupid, means you're not perfect. And, and that's really the tragedy of it. This, 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 they're not friends of ours, but this couple that said they never had any upsets, they never argued and all that. Well, their, their son was so screwed up because he was so upset with his mom and dad, he blew his brains out in their kitchen. And you go... Well, so much for a perfect marriage, you know, your kid commits suicide. But they couldn't even admit that. That's the sad part of it. They had to keep pretending they were perfect. You know, when I was a kid, it was father knows best, you know. Hi, Jude. Hi, Ward. How oh, aren't we all wonderful here and all this? And you look at Princess Diane, Princess Di. She became the future queen of England. And she had the most miserable life being married to Prince Charles. So to uh, to sit there and live and live, you know, live in this fairy tale, oh, and they lived happily ever after again. You're not being in reality. The question is, how do you handle the upsets? And that's why Ryan's book, Stillness Is the Key, is a very important to read, right? Yes, and you know, you and I have always had that point of view that when something happens, it looks like tragedy or crisis or whatever, we always have said, well, this will make us better. Once we get through this, this will make us better. And I remember telling some people that early on, and they were like, what are you talking about? This is crazy. What do you, what do you mean this will make you better? This is a disaster. Da, 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 da. And they just looked at the negative without looking at, okay, so when we, what are we going to learn from this? How, how, what didn't we know that this thing came up? What should we have done differently? What are we going to do differently in the future? I mean, it's every single upset is an opportunity to learn and grow. Yeah, so. all upsets are opportunities to learn know the truth about yourself. Yeah. yeah. So when I'm upset with Kim, it's really about me, not about and her. And uh, when I'm upset with Robert, it really is about Robert. <laughs> it is. I don't blame you. <laughs> But I look at I look at upsets, <laughs> mistakes, and failures, and money problems as opportunities. Now, it doesn't make me happy that I have them, but if I don't take my mind and condition it that way, then what I'll do instead is I'll just go to the bar, have a couple of beers, eat some chicken wings, and pretend my well, problems most, are gone. Most people don't want to be uncomfortable. They don't right. want to face that, so they don't want the problems. So they do everything possible to avoid the problems. They lead a boring life, and they don't grow and they don't learn. I ran a program recently, it was called Get Real About Your Money, and everybody had to hire a bookkeeper, and they had to come to the class with their real financial numbers. It was painful, because looking at your financials, it's like looking in the mirror, and a lot of them didn't like what they saw. Now, most of them didn't do anything, they just, the pain was just too intense to realize they were broke. Not that they're broke, but they were running on empty. You know, they make a lot of money, but they were spending more than they were making, so eventually the, the end of the road was coming up. They had no retirement. They had no nothing pre- prepared for any emergency. You know, the average American doesn't have 400 bucks for an emergency. So that's what I call running on empty. But when they look at it, to make the changes would be too painful. And that's why most people die broke. That was my poor dad. He died broke. You know, he, he lost his job, he lost his pension, and he was finished. 
but he couldn't look at the numbers. So the reason Kim and I created the cash flow board game and Rich Dad Poor Dad is if you can look at the numbers, you might have a chance. But truthfully, the reason most people are poor in whatever areas of life, they just can't look at the numbers. There's something really messed up in their lives. And they're poor, they can't, you know, as Jack Nicholson said in that movie, A Few Good Men, you can't handle the truth. And that's what the financial statement does. You have to look at the truth. So are Kim and I perfect financially? Hell no, we've had financial problems bigger than most people. But if I don't take my mind and say, okay, we're gonna look at this whole thing and we're gonna get smarter and better from it, then go quiet and handle the problem. If we don't look at it as a growing opportunity, I'm at the bar sucking down beer and eating the chicken wings, right, Kim? That's correct. So anyway, that's why Ryan Holiday's book, Stillness is the Key, can you get still with your problems? Can you, can you handle the truth? And I handle the truth in my stillness because bad things are really good things if you can see the other side of it. So once again, I thank Ryan Holiday. His book is Stillness is the Key, and you can submit your questions to askrobert at richdadradio.com. And thank you for listening to this program.